This is a tutorial on row reduction of a matrix using row operations into echelon form and then into reduced echelon form. When performing this on an augmented matrix which consists of a coefficient matrix of a system of linear equations concatenated with the solution vector, the row reduction creates a system with the same solution set but in a different, more convenient form. The echelon form can tell a lot about the properties of a system of equations. The reduced form makes writing the solution set very simple. This video will not go into the implications of the echelon and reduced echelon forms. The focus will be the actual row reduction procedure. So suppose we start out with a system of equations like this. So we have six unknowns and four equations. We can write this in the standard matrix equation form by creating the coefficient matrix for this, which is going to be... From this, we can form the augmented matrix of the system by concatenating the coefficient matrix with a solution vector. This is the matrix that we're actually going to be working with. And so now, we want to perform reduction on this matrix. In order to do that, we're going to use row operations in order to create the two matrix forms mentioned before, the echelon form and the reduced echelon form. The three operations are shown right here. We can interchange two rows of the augmented matrix, we can multiply all the entries in a row by a non-zero constant, and we can replace one row by the sum of itself and a multiple of another row. So let's see how this will work on our example. This is our original matrix as it's written right here and the first thing that we want to do is to get a non-zero entry into the top left position. So we're going to use a row interchange and the way we're going to denote that, so row equivalence is shown by this kind of a tilde and we're going to write the exact operation that we perform on top of it. So in this case we're going to swap row 1 and row 2. And the resulting matrix is then going to be... And now one more thing we want to do is create a 1 in this top left position. So we're just going to divide every entry in row 1 by 2. So to write that operation we're going to say that 1 half row 1 is going to then go into row 1. Now we're going to try to create zeros below the first non-zero entry in row 1. So specifically we're going to use this entry in order to create zeros everywhere below it by using the row operations. So to do that, well there's already a zero in row two, so that's good for us. To create zeros below the one in the first column, we're going to use the third operation, replace one row by the sum of itself and a multiple of another row. Specifically in this case we're going to take row three plus negative two times row one and put that into row three. And then for the last row, the fourth row, we're just going to add row four and row one and put that into row four. So now we have this matrix, which is again row equivalent, that is we just performed row operations from the beginning to here. The next step, since we have all zeros below this first entry, is we're going to try to do the same thing to the rest of this matrix, that is to the sub-matrix that's left under here. In other words, what we're going to do is we're going to ignore these entries and perform the same thing we just did to everything that's left. The reason we can do that, we can ignore this column for example, is because every operation that we do on rows 2 through 4 
is not going to affect the first column since all of their entries are zeros. Therefore, taking any multiple, interchanging any rows, or adding multiples of rows to other rows will not change the first column of these second, third, and fourth rows. So we're going to do the same kind of thing. Again, we want to create a 1 in the top left corner. In this case, we already start off with a non-zero entry, so we can just scale it. And so we'll put negative 1 half of row 2 into row 2. Now, we're going to try to create zeros below this entry over here. So the same way that we did before, up here, we're going to do the same thing here. So we're going to take this and we're going to create zeros below it. So now, the operation that we're going to perform is going to be taking row 3 and adding negative 7 times row 2 to it and putting that back into row 3. And for the fourth row, we're going to say that's going to be row 4 plus 4 row 1 is going to go into row 4. Now, since we created these zeros, we're going to look for the next non-zero entry in the following row which is in this case 3 and we're going to block out everything else to the left and on top of it. So now this, this, and these are also zeros so they won't affect things if we do row operations on row number 3 and 4 none of these zeros are going to matter so we're just going to focus on this submatrix now. So once again we'll start off by scaling and we'll say that one-third row 3 replaces row 3. So then one more step is to say that row 4 plus row 3 replaces row 4. So this all together is equal to, so now we are actually in a in an echelon form, in the first form that we wanted to get into. So this is in echelon form. What this means is that we have a non-zero entry as the first entry in each row and everything before it is zeros. Everything below these first non-zero entries is a zero and all zero rows are below any non-zero rows. These first entries here don't have to necessarily be a one in the echelon form. They can be scaled by anything and therefore there isn't just one echelon form for any given system of equations, but there is only one reduced echelon form and we'll see that shortly. So these positions with the non-zero entries are called pivot positions and the corresponding columns are the pivot columns. Everything that's not a pivot column is a free variable. I don't want to focus on that though in this video because the point is just to show an example of the row reduction and not to necessarily talk about the implications. So now we want to get into the reduced form. So the first thing we're going to do is actually we're going to work backwards and create zeros above all of the pivot positions. So just like before we used the leading entries to create zeros below them, we're going to do the same thing to create those entries to zeros above them. So in this case we're going to start with this position and we're going to create zeros above it by using the same kind of row operations as before. We're going to say that row 1 plus row 3 replaces row 1. Now we're going to use 
our next pivot position, this one, to create zeros above it. In this case, again, this will be just one operation. We will take row 1 plus 2, row 2, and replace row 1 with that. And this is our reduced echelon form. It's characterized by the fact that every leading entry, every pivot, is a 1, and every entry both below and above each pivot is a 0. This is a unique form for a system of linear equations and you will get to it no matter which one of these other systems of equations you start with, whereas the echelon form is not necessarily unique since you can scale uh, each row. This is going to be unique. You have a 1 in the leading positions, in the pivot positions, and you have zeros everywhere above and below them. Taking one more step in this solution, we can see uh, why this form is nicer than the original form by writing out the solution set. So we get these three equations which show the basic variables, that is the pivot column variables, in terms of the free variables and the constants. So more specifically, this can be rewritten as, so again, we have our basic variables, the pivot columns, in terms of the free variables and the constants. And then this can be written as a solution set, and that is going to be equal to, and so this can be finally written as, and this is the solution in parametric vector form. Overall, we've taken a system of equations and replaced it by another system of equations with the same solution set. The new form makes many desirable properties of the system easy to find and also makes the solution set easy to write. There are very many applications of row reduction, so it's a good idea to practice it. After some practice, the row operations become much easier to perform and the whole procedure becomes easier.